Lord, thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Thank you that your mercy comes like the dew every morning, that your kindness never stops, that it's so consistent. You are consistent. You are a good God who never, ever fails, who keeps all of his promises, who remains the eternal truth on and on, year by year, season by season. Your truth remains. Your love, your goodness, your radiant grace remains over our lives. We pray now, Lord, that you would receive this time together as we, your people, joyfully gather to glorify your name. We pray that you would receive it unto your glory, that you would speak through your servant, and that you would bring us nearer to you. Yes, Lord. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Does God really love me? And if so, why? Tammy was 18 years old, and she looked in the mirror, and a hot tear ran from the corner of her right eye. It was about to be the beginning of the spring semester. It was a cold January, and she did not want to go to school. She did not want to go anywhere. What she saw reflected was too much fat, thin hair, drooping bags beneath her unrested eyes. Her mom called up from downstairs in an angry voice in Chinese, you'll be late! Her mom was still angry about the bad grades she'd received last semester. Not quite a 4.0. Her mirror and her report card told her that she didn't measure up. Nock gripped the steering wheel with all of his strength in frustration as he drove home from work. I am such an idiot, he thought to himself. He'd been at the same job for 10 years without a single promotion. And that morning he had had the opportunity to interview for a supervisor position and he had lost his words. He practiced in the mirror five times the night before. But when he was there in front of his boss, it's like he got, he got caught, he got tongue-tied, he couldn't speak. And he made a fool of himself there. At the end of the interview, the boss said something like, this has been a waste of time. He thought subconsciously, maybe it had to do with just his appearance and his physical structure. He'd always been made fun of for being such a small man, short with a small frame. From the time he was 10, he was mercilessly teased. He felt like everyone literally looked down on him because of his height. And as he was driving home, gripping that wheel, he felt sort of like maybe he was the waste of time. It's the twilight years of Emma's life. Her husband has passed away and her old house creaks in the evenings. No one seems to talk to her anymore. She sees her grandkids who live in New York almost not even twice a year. Her friends are passing away and dying her social activities are less than ever. She just had to give up serving on the welcome team in her church because she was too tired. And it seems like she is quickly becoming totally insignificant. Does God love me? And if so, why? Welcome back to Truth Lutheran Church. It has been an incredible summer. We've been so blessed by so many things. We just had a wedding yesterday. We've been blessed by college students being here this summer. There's been 
different activities of all kinds, and it's been amazing. Some of our friends are back from summer trips. And some of our college students are going back home. I want to talk to you this morning as we begin the message. I want to talk to you about God's love. I want to talk to you about God's love. We're beginning a new series this morning, sort of a mini-series. It's going to be four sermons called Loved. Loved. Loved 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we're just going to kind of dive in and explore the idea of God's love because sometimes God's love can be hard to understand. If you have been a Christian for any amount of time, you have no doubt heard that God loves you. Jesus loves you is almost a cliche now. You know one of the most popular verses in the Bible, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But sometimes the facts and feelings of our lives seem to contradict that statement. I remember two summers ago in 2016, I was sitting in my living room. The window was open and this warm breeze was coming in. I was surrounded by friends. And we had a visiting pastor there named Father Victor. And we had just done some evening prayer and he asked if anyone wanted to receive prayer. And I raised my hand. I was like, yeah, pray for me. That summer I had been struggling with sort of this weird sense of being unloved. And I couldn't really trace it very well. Like I had friends, like I knew my family loved me, like I was doing well in a lot of ways, but I just had this nagging feeling in my heart of being unloved, being sort of unwanted, unworthy. Whether it has to do with your self-image when you look in the mirror, or whether it has to do with how you're doing in your career, whether it has to do with aging, or whether you don't know exactly where it's coming from. We all go through seasons in our lives, or times in our lives, when we feel unlovable. Moments in our lives when we feel like we cannot be loved, we should not be loved. And we all doubt God's love. And we want to understand it more. You want to understand it more, I think. I certainly do. I want to understand this idea. I want to see if it's true that God really, really does love me. Despite all the rejection I receive in my life. Despite all the things people say. Despite all the standards that I don't seem to measure up to. Is it really true that God loves me? And if so, why? That's our big question today. Joshua's bringing it up for us. Does God really love me? And if so, why? Starting a four-part series this morning, and we're just going to look at one level of God's love. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to end up looking at three levels, three levels of God's love. We're going to kind of stack them. Three levels of God's love, and we're going to look at level one this morning. We're going to begin to answer our question by opening your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We're looking at two texts this morning. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to be also drawing from Psalm 139. Genesis chapter 2. Should be pretty easy to find. It's at the very beginning of your Bible in Psalm 139, which is sort of the middle book of your Bible. Here's what you can expect in today's message. In today's message, I'm going to make two simple points about God's love. Two simple points about God's love for us. God's uh, God's level one love. 
And then I'm going to sort of deal with two <coughs> contradictions to God's love, two seeming, seeming contradictions that kind of get into our heart. We're going to begin this series, and we're going to go this week, take a break next week, and the three weeks following that. Does God really love me? If so, why? Level one love. And we're going to begin uh, looking at our text in Genesis chapter 2. Before we jump in, would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for these men and women who are here. The faithful remnant who are willing to come and hear from you. Thank you for your relationship with them. Thank you for how you've been drawing and wooing them, how you've seen them even from their birth. Now, Lord, we pray that as we open your word, you would open our hearts, you would open our ears and remove all distractions, you would open our minds to you and help us to hear. Thank you, Lord confident you're working already. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. The Lord spoke into creation, and his words became like a paintbrush, like the hands of a sculptor, and all things began to be. The Lord spoke from the darkness, from the blackness of nothingness, and said, let there be light. And there splashed forth the radiant yellow and white of illuminating light. The Lord took his careful words in his hands and he separated the light from the darkness. The light he called day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning on the first day. And the Lord looked into this world of water and chaos and he put his hands there, it seemed, and he separated the waters below from the waters that were above, making sky and making sea. And he drew out of those waters and pulled up the dry land that came sifting and rocking from beneath the waters. And he began to form the continents and the islands and all the places of the earth. And the Lord covered, combed, brushed, painted over all the earth seeds, plants, living things of their kind. Soon green and yellow and Red were unfolding and unfurling by his fingertips as he drew out all the plant life. He took his sculptor's knife and he carved into the heavens dazzling stars. He lit the sun and the moon and hung them in the expanse of the dark. And then he came back to the earth and he began to splash and dot birds of the heavens in their kind. Silver and black and blue fish of the sea began to swarm through the oceans. On the sixth day, he reached down into the dust of the earth and pulled up all colorful menageries of many creatures. Zebras and elephants and bears and 
insects and horses and everything you can imagine the Lord pulled into existence until there was a beautiful, lavish, exploding, living earth celebrating and dancing before its artistic maker. And when the Lord came to the end of the sixth day, this symphony of created, of created expression, this harmony of divine art took a pause for just a moment. And in Genesis 1.26, it says, it shows that the Lord took counsel with himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit creating together, pause as one and they speak. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 5 we see a closer look at the creation of man. At this time, no bush of the field had yet sprouted. And as I imagine it in my mind, I see sort of a dark gray-brown landscape, clay and dark soil over the earth. There was a mist like white and gray, wafting over the surface of the earth, watering those plant seeds that the Lord has formed. And I see the Lord come in dazzling white, walking over the surface of the earth. The Lord bent down on the soft soil, and he reached his hands into the clay. Strong, masculine hands, the, man, the hands of a master artist. And he begins to work and gather and pull the clay into one. And his careful hands begin to form, to smooth and pull, to prod and shape. Every muscle curvature, every sinew, every organ as his hands polish and shine, they pull longer, they stretch wider, just the way the curvature of the nostrils, the indents of the ears, the intricacies of eyes and vision. Lord works smoothly and calmly. He smiles over his creation as he shakes. Patiently, gently, affectionately, working and moving the soil in clay. Until there lays before him his hands dirty with the mud, an image that is a reflection, something like himself. Man lays before him, but cold and gray. And it says that the Lord breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living being. Adam rises up in newness of life, in a new world and new creation, breaking out in the eyes of his joyful father, a reflection 
of the one who had made me. But it was not good for man to be alone. And so the Lord took from Adam's rib or even Adam's side, put Adam back into a deep sleep, and he took from Adam's rib or his side, and he took and formed with that same detail and care and love and affection, the same intentionality, another being, one to be with Adam. And he breathed also into her nostrils the breath of life. And the woman also became a living being. We see from the very beginning of Scripture, from the creation account, that human beings are God's creation. That human beings are God's incredible artistic, intentional creation. Human beings are God's intentional creation. We see that in the beginning with Adam and Eve. But is it true also about ourselves? For us, we think, well, not really. I mean, I wasn't made in some prehistoric garden. I wasn't formed from pieces of clay or dirt, right? I'm different. I came from my mother. It was just genetics. It was just something, right? But maybe our creation isn't so different from that of Adam and Eve. Look at how David talks about his own creation in Psalm chapter 139. In Psalm chapter 139, David muses his own over his own construction. And he says this in Psalm 139, verse 13, David speaking to the Lord of his creation. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret place, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. In your book were written all my days before one of them was yet to be. David sees himself and his own creation with a similar intentionality as that of Adam and Eve. Though David was formed in his mother's womb, he sees the Lord as weaving him together, as constructing him, as pushing and pulling, as setting everything about him in place. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 2, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. The Lord says, Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. And Jeremiah went to the potter's house and he found a potter who was making clay pots. He was pushing and forming clay with wet hands, right? His hands dirty in the work of his creation. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Just as the potter is to the clay, so am I to the house of Israel. Israel is my clay, Jeremiah. My people are the works of my hand. Does God love me? And if so, why? If we're going to understand God's love, we have to understand who we are. We have to understand who we are. One, human beings are God's creation. You are God's creation. You are God's intentional, artistic creation. God formed you with the same intentionality, with the same artistry that he used when he formed Adam and Eve. 
God created you. You think, no, it was just science, it was just genetics, it was just this long line of history that made me. But that's not the only thing. You see, science is God's servant. You see, genetics are under the power of God, under His will, under His intention. And He saw who you would be a hundred generations before you were born. And He prepared it and designed it and planned it so that you would be who you are. God made you intentionally. He gave you the shape of your face and the width of your hip and the level of your intelligence, and the color of your hair, and your eyes, and the place you would be born, and the family that you had, and all the natural gifts, all the natural abilities and inabilities, every part of you, every good created part of you is a gift intentionally made by God. The Psalms say those who insult the poor bring shame or dishonor to their maker. Those who who insult, those who take and look at themselves or look at others and they see them in their intended creation as a mistake, insult their maker. God has created you intentionally, beautifully, in a way that is not mistaken, in a way that is not a mistake. You are God's intentional creation. And being God's intentional creation, that that means something. It means something. So the Lord God breathes into Adam and Eve the breath of life. And man and woman became a living being. Life had exploded across the earth, beautiful and good, the sky radiant blue. The sun shining in all its majestic brilliance. The rivers were flowing. The animals were tame and kind. There was no death. There was no disease. Nothing was wrong. Everything a gorgeous paradise. Adam and Eve walked in the garden. And when the Lord had finished all of his work, creating heaven and earth and all things in six days, The Lord stepped back from his work and he reflected on what his hands had made. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, the Lord is like an artist having completed his painting. He steps back and he looks at the artwork of what he has made in Genesis 1, chapter 31. And it says... And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. It was very good. You see, the quality of artwork has a lot to do with the quality of the artist. If you are a good artist, then you will often produce good art. If you are a great artist, then you will almost always produce good art. But if you are a perfect artist, you will only produce good art. David reflects upon his own creation in Psalm chapter 139. David praises the Lord of God's goodness, of God's greatness, and he looks upon his own making and he says this 
in Psalm 139, verse 13. He says, you formed my inward parts, Lord. It was you. You were the artist. You were the maker. You were the craftsman. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows this full well. My frame was not hidden from you. You saw my unformed body. And verse 17, how precious are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would be more than the sands of the sea. I am awake and I am still with you. David looked at his creation. Adam and Eve could look at their creation and they could praise God. They could say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Tell me this, when you look in the mirror, when you think about yourself, when you get rejected at your job, when you feel lonely, can you look at yourself and can you say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made? Because being the creation of God means something. Does God love me? If so, why? If God is an artist and you are his art piece, it means that you are good. It means that there is a fundamental goodness in you through the creation of God. What does it mean to be loved by God? Why are we loved by God? One, you are God's creation, and if you are God's creation, God is an artist that only makes good work. God is an artist that only makes good work, and it means that you, in a fundamental creative way, are good, which means three. It means that you are God's good creation. You are God's good creation. It means that God took his hands and he formed you in your mother's womb. He chose everything about you. He chose even the, the level of your inabilities. And all these things were good that God designed, he created, he detailed you like art. He made you and set you apart different from everyone else. You are a unique reflection of the image of God. You are a unique reflection of the image of God. And grace can't reflect him like Brian does. And Brian can't reflect him like Nelson does. Or Jesse or Samuel or Darren. But every one of you has been created in the image of God to reflect him in your own beautiful way that we are God's good creation. You are good in your creation. You are good in your creation. There's a profound and deep goodness in who you are. But we don't, we don't always feel that. Do we? we don't always see that. We don't always believe that. There's two main reasons that we have such a hard time seeing the deep goodness of our creation. The first is a lie of direct contradiction. Lord had created Adam and Eve. But there was someone who did not want them to know, did not want them to believe that they were a good creation. 
There's a fallen angel whose name was Lucifer. We know him as Satan. And Satan had snuck his way into that perfect paradise garden. One day Eve was walking amidst the trees of the garden. The Lord had given Adam and Eve just one command. He said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the other trees of the garden are good for food, but this tree you shall not eat of it. For on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And as Adam and Eve moseyed through their paradise, Satan, in the form of a serpent, spoke to Eve in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. Perhaps he poked his head into the sunlight. <coughs> and he said to the woman, Did God really say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And she said, no, God said that we can eat of any tree except this one, except this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did Satan say to her? Eve told Satan that if we eat of the tree, and she added, if we even touch it, we will surely die. And Satan said, you will not surely die. But the Lord knows that if you eat of it, you will become wise like God, knowing good and evil. You see, Satan wanted Eve to believe that she was deficient that God had held something back from her, that God had made her in a, a stupid, foolish, sort of broken way, that God was a creator who made bad creation, and when he made her, she was deficient of something she was supposed to have. If God, if, if Satan can get you to believe that you were created broken. If Satan can get you to believe that God cheated you, that God left something out, that God didn't give you the wisdom or the beauty or the something that you were supposed to have when you were born, he can cut away the fundamental sense of love that God has tried to give you. Satan told Eve he drew her into a false understanding of who she was. And he led her away to step out of the love of God. Does God really love me? If so, why? God loves you because you are God's good creation. And in your creation, he has put such a profound wholeness, such a profound beauty, just the unique way that you are. But we don't believe it, and we don't believe it because there are lies that are coming against us that say that we are deficient in our creation, that we are broken, that we're not this enough, we're not that enough, we're not something, we're not like this person, we're not over there, we don't have this career, we don't have this level. There are two lies that basically come against our understanding of our love and creation. The first is the contradiction that we are a bad creation. That's the first lie, which we're a bad creation, not a good creation. And the second is that our, <coughs> our corruption has voided our good creation. The first lie is that we are not a good creation. It's a direct contradiction of what God says. God says, you are a good creation. The lie says, you are a bad creation. You are failed from the beginning. You're faulty. And the second lie is that our corruption has voided our good creation. If you think about it, we all have been corrupted in some ways, haven't we? 
We all have been corrupted in some ways. Maybe you have a disease in your body. Maybe you engaged in activities that damaged your brain. We are all corrupted in our souls and our spirits. We have sin, right? And we say we can say we were a good creation, but that creation has become corrupted, and now no, it's over. Now we don't deserve love. Now we're unlovable, right? Now this goes against the story that Scripture tells us. Remember the story of the prodigal son. It's found in Luke chapter 15. We'll retell it in kind of a different way. Once there was a man whose name was, say, John. In 1998, John stood in a clean hospital room, in a blue hospital gown at precisely 4.07 a.m. His wife had gone into labor the afternoon before. He had waited this long time, nervous and anxious, watching his wife as she travailed through the labor and pain. But finally, when the pain was over, she had brought forth a beautiful baby daughter. Tammy was her name. And that morning, the dark hours, John held in his hands for the first time his beautiful child. She had big brown eyes, just like her mother. Her grandfather's chin and John's dark hair. He trembled as he held his first child, this baby girl. And tears flowed from his eyes. He loved her with all his heart, and she was breathtakingly beautiful. She took his breath away. And they began their life from that point. But as Tammy grew up, she couldn't seem to grasp the love of her father and mother. It's like she couldn't seem to get it. She couldn't see herself in that positive way. She could not see her own beauty. She began to become rebellious when she was 13 and 14 years old. To hang with the wrong crowd at school, started to get into drinking, into alcohol. By the time she was 17 years old, Tammy's parents had done everything they could for her. John and his wife had done everything they could imagine. They'd gotten counseling with their pastor. They had gone to rehab, all these things, and it didn't help. And at 17 years old, Tammy ran away from home. Her father, John, and her mother were heartbroken. She ran far from home to a distant city out of state. And she fell into a very broken lifestyle. She got into harder drugs. She was doing cocaine. She couldn't get out of it. She fell into sexual sins. She covered her, bodies, her body with tattoos. She gained scars from physical fights from drug use and evil encounters. She even got sick. She got sick and ill, and her teeth began to rot, and her hair began to fall out. And she lived in that lifestyle for three years, from the time she was 17 and a half to the time she was 20, almost 21. Her life had fallen apart. She, her body, so much about her, her identity seemed to have totally fallen apart. Completely corrupt, right? But like the prodigal son, she came to her senses one day. 
So far away from her father and mother, she came to her senses and she said, I will arise and I will go back to my father and my mother. And somehow she scraped up the money, a bus ticket and a very long walk until one day she knocked on the door of her house. And her father came to the door and he answered it. And he saw his daughter who was so broken. Her thin hair, thin and sickly, ill and tattooed and pierced and totally different from who she was before. where her father held her face in his hand. And though her father was aware of the scars and he was aware of the sickness and he was aware of the brokenness, her father saw her mother's eyes and her grandfather's chin and his own dark hair. And no matter how corrupt his daughter had become, her father always saw the goodness of her creation, the goodness of her creation. And she would always be his daughter and his love. And he welcomed her back home. When the prodigal son came back to the father's house, the father didn't say, you're too corrupt, you're too broken, I don't know you, I disown you. He said, my son was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he is found. Because no matter what corruption came into the life of the son, he was still his creation. And he still saw the goodness of what he had made. And the goodness of how you are made can never be taken away. It can never be taken away. No matter what people do to you. No matter how you fail. No matter how you hurt yourself. No matter how you suffer. There is a fundamental goodness in your creation. And how God has made you. And it can never be taken away. God loves you. God loves you so much. And he loves you because you are lovable as his good creation. Because you're not trash. You're not garbage. You're not a corruption. You're not a mistake. God doesn't make trash. God doesn't make garbage. God's an artist who makes good work and he has made you an intricate, intentional, beautiful piece of his creation. And you weren't created broken. And your corruption hasn't erased your creation. But you are still, no matter where you are, no matter what you've been through, <coughs> you are God's good creation. And he loves you. He loves you so much. And I hope you can understand that. In closing, here's the final word. In closing, we all experience these times where we don't feel loved, right? Where you don't feel loved or you don't feel lovable, right? Maybe it's in the moments at night when you're lying on your bed and the house is quiet. Maybe no one knows about it. Maybe you haven't told people about it. Maybe you have. But you don't feel love. You will feel the love of God 
you will be able to live in the love of God, to walk in that deep love of God. When you truly allow yourself to believe that you're loved. When you really allow yourself to believe that you're the good creation and that you're loved. Only your own heart can stop you from experiencing God's love. And you think that there's some kind of benefit, there's some kind of strength in denying God's love. It's a lie. It's not good. It's not true. It doesn't make you strong. It doesn't make you tough. To run yourself down, to criticize yourself, to break your heart. So open the door. This sermon is your challenge. This sermon is your challenge to be courageous enough because somehow it's frightening. I haven't worked that all out, but somehow it's frightening. But to be courageous enough to allow yourself to believe your love. Allow yourself to believe that you are the good creation of God. and that you are most profoundly loved. You really are. <laughs> and God's going to use this sermon to open up a new level of love in your life if you're willing to receive it. You can walk and live in that love. Why does God love you? <coughs> Our very first block, most basic reason for God's love, his love for everyone, God loves humankind, he loves us because we are his good creation, pray with me, Lord Jesus we choose to receive, Father we choose to believe, we choose to believe that we are your good creation. That our corruption is not greater than the creation. That there is even a redemption to take away the corruption. But we believe, Lord, that we are not trash, but we are your treasures. We believe, Lord, that no matter what the world says about us, no matter what other people say about us, no matter the rejection and the hatred, no matter a sense of self-condemnation, we are your good creation. We thank you, Father, for putting your spirit in us, for making us just as we are in every detail of who we are. We choose to walk in your love. We choose to walk in the joy and the peace that comes from being loved and always knowing we are loved. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What if you lived every day in the conviction that you are profoundly loved? What if you lived, what if you woke up and you knew so heavily, so powerfully in your heart that you were loved this day, right? And the rejections and the pain and like the not measuring up, that was secondary to your identity of being loved. When you, live in, when you live in that way, it changes your life, right? It makes you free. It makes you joyful. When you are loved, life is rich and full. When you're rejected, when you feel like you're worthless, you're unvalued, it cuts your life away. It cuts your hope away. It cuts your joy away. It's the truth that you are God's good creation and God loves you. Let yourself believe it. It's not dangerous to believe it. It's good. It's going to free your heart so you can truly serve God, so you can truly be who God's called you to be. It comes out of the center of love. I'm going to pray for you. 
Lord, thank you for the journey of realizing your love. Thanks for the journey of realizing your love. Thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, Lord. We know it full well. We choose to believe your love. We allow our hearts to open to the, tr to the truth that we are loved. Bless these men and women, Lord. Watch over them this week. Watch over our brothers and sisters as they go back to school. Build them up, build them up, build us up in your love, in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.